I'm Ian Solomon. Um, hopefully I will be a familiar face to people in this village and maybe to those <coughs> who've travelled from farther afield after the campaign meetings of the last few weeks. Uh, this election shouldn't be about Brexit. It should be about climate change and the looming environmental disaster. It should be about homes and the housing crisis that we're facing in the country. It should be about the crisis of funding in the NHS and in our schools. It should also be about our values and standing up to right-wing populism. And because it's about all those things, it is about Brexit. If we go through with Boris Johnson's Brexit, as a country we'll be left poorer, more isolated, our nations divided, seeking the friendship of Donald Trump or Xi Jinping. That's not a future that I want, and that's why I'm standing for the Liberal Democrats. Now, I've been, a, I've been uh, in Cambridgeshire for over 14 years. Uh, like many people, I came here to study at the university, and I stayed because I love this part of the world. I moved to Grantchester in 2012 uh, with my then baby son, uh, Eric, who some of you may know, and he now goes to school in Coton. And last year I was elected as a district councillor um, in the Lib Dem landslide in the local elections. And I'm really proud to, to represent this, this community. It's a real privilege, but I know that I could do so much more for South Cambridge here as your MP. Now, I think I've got the background to do it. So I've got a science background. I came to study for an astrophysics PhD, which I got in 2010. And since then, I've been working helping all sorts of businesses make better, more evidence-based decisions. And that's something I think we could do with a lot more of in politics. When I look at ignorant politicians who don't know the significance of Dover to our trade before they recommend leaving the EU, or the sectarian nature of Northern Irish politics. I think that we can do a lot better. The, the Brexit process has been characterised by the, by the Conservatives trying to figure out what Brexit even means. While the Labour Party have decided, have, have tried to avoid answering that question altogether. The Liberal Democrats are clear that Brexit is a folly and we will put a stop to it. So that's why I'm standing for South Cambridgeshire and I do hope you'll give me your vote on the 12th of December. Wherever you go, we always have this issue with the microphone size. Uh, <laughs> Anthony and I are slightly shorter. <laughs> slightly. Right, hello, good evening. My name is Dan Grief, and I'm the Labour candidate here in South Cambridgeshire in the general election this time. I was here both in 2017 and 2015, coming second both times. And the reason I'm standing comes down to sort of three main themes. The first one, of course, is that this is a Brexit election. Secondly, we have a social crisis. And thirdly, this is also a climate election. I want to talk about each of those. But before I do, a bit about myself. So I came to this area in 2012. I met my wife, Besna, who uh, moved here coincidentally on the same day. We met in this city. Uh, we've had our family here, we got married here, and we've raised our family, and we love this area. And we've come to make this our community and our home. And over the, that time, I have seen real changes in this area. And that's partly a reason why I'm standing as well, to stand up for our local environment. So when it comes to the social crisis, now we know full well at this very moment in time that one third of the children in our country are living in poverty. And I don't know, maybe you saw the documentary that came out on television this week from Channel 4. Uh, it was called Growing Up in Poverty, the Breadline, uh, I think it's Breadline Children. And if you look at that documentary, you'll be shocked to see families in Cambridge who can't afford to live. And that's things such as the universal credit, the uh, bedroom tax, the PIP, the personal independence payments, those policies have had a really devastating effect on so many people in this country. 
And we live in the fifth largest economy in the world, and yet there is so much suffering. And that's something that's been going on a lot longer than Brexit. We secondly have a climate crisis as well. And we are being told, if we don't do something drastically in the next 11 years, that we are facing catastrophe for biodiversity, for resources, for life on this planet. We have to act now. And that's why the Labour proposal is a bold step to really make a difference. We have to act now, because if we don't act now, this problem will only get worse. People suffer, the planet will not go on for much longer at this rate until we have a real problem. And thirdly, I said it comes down to Brexit as well. Now, I'm a Remainer. I'm fighting for Remain in this election. And Labour is the only party, the only party, that can offer a people's vote if it gets into government. We are facing the following situation. Let's look at the mathematics. As we're in Cambridge, we like to look at maths. You either have a hung parliament with a Conservative or a Labour minority government, or you have a majority Labour government or a majority Conservative government. And my fear is that we walk into a situation where Boris Johnson's deal gets passed through. And if it does, we've even had Rob today talking about pharmaceutical price setting could go up. I worry that we have real threat to our NHS. And so I say, let's have a people's vote. Let's go for democracy to heal some of the division in our country. And part of that people's vote is, on the one hand, having a deal which will not destroy our economy, but what I will fight for is remain. It's the last chance we have, and I think it's the best chance we have for our country. And if we don't try to take that option now, I worry what sort of country we're going to pass on to our children. Now, the other thing I want to talk about tonight, and I'm sure it will come up as well, is some of the literature we've seen in this election. I want to have this evening an honest debate about issues, about policy. I think it's really sad to see manipulation of voters and tactical voting and all the rest of it. I want to talk about how we can actually talk about a positive vision for the future and what sort of government do we want to hand on to make sure this country is safe for future generations. So I welcome your questions and I want to talk about all those issues tonight. Thank you very much. You can guess my process of elimination. I'm Anthony Brown, I'm the Conservative candidate for South Cambridgeshire. This is uh, my home constituency, it's where I was uh, uh, well, born in Cambridge. Uh, Mill Road Maternity Hostel, grew up in Falmere, on a very small farm there, went to school there, and then uh, I got a bursary to go to the Perth School, uh, which the County Council gave at the time. Uh, and then went to Hills Road, Sixth Form College, and then went further up Hills Road to study maths at the university. Um, so there's quite a few members of the audience that have known me since I was a child. Um, I then became, despite being a mathematician, I became a, a journalist. I was at the Times, BBC and Observer. I was uh, Chief Political Correspondent at the Times. I was Economics Correspondent Observer uh, and uh, of the BBC. Um, and then I worked for uh, the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, in his first term in charge of economic and business policy. I had budget responsibility for about a billion pounds. Uh, and I started various uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, I was responsible for the uh, business rates financing aspects of uh, Crossrail. Uh, and I then became chief executive of the British Bankers Association, responsible for the reforms, coordinating the reforms and negotiating the reforms of the banking industry in the wake of the financial crisis. So, in particular, making sure the banks never need to be bailed out by taxpayers again. It's completely understandable. The taxpayers are incredibly annoyed by that. I'm a taxpayer, I'm annoyed. Uh, but also making sure the banks don't uh, missell to customers, they carry on treating customers uh, fairly. So I'm not a career politician, as you can tell, but I've decided uh, to throw my hat in the ring, uh, partly because this constituency came up, and it's the constituency I know uh, and love, where I was, uh, grew up and got married, where my family lived. Uh, it's also uh, because I worry about the state of politics, and uh, I worry about uh, where politics is going in this country. I think it's important that we have uh, people are prepared to not just complain about things, but actually put their uh, hats in the ring. So I'm worried about trust in politics, where that's going at the moment. I worry also um, about uh, Jeremy Corbyn, to be blunt, and uh, that actually there are always people like Jeremy Corbyn, we know that. Uh, I worry about the fact that so many millions of people felt they needed to vote for somebody who uh, wants to, who hasn't learned anything from the collapse of socialism and wants to uh, um, and, and is always finds the enemies of Britain are his friends. Um, we've got to have more confidence in ourselves <laughs> as, as a country, and I want to help restore that. Um, I've been trying to campaign on local issues, which I'll come to in a second, but obviously I've been canvassing for four months, and the question of Brexit keeps coming up. And my position there really is uh, is the democratic one. Uh, in fact, I've, I'm actually half Norwegian as it happens, and I'm part Irish, part French. I've lived in Brussels, I was Europe. 
correspondent of the Times. I've written books on the EU and the Euro and European reform. Uh, there are strong arguments for and against Brexit, but we did have a referendum. At the time, every major political party, including Lib Dems and Labour, said they res they'd respect the results of the referendum. It did have a result. Uh, we then had an election where 80% of MPs were elected on a manifesto commitment to uh, deliver the result of the referendum. Uh, it hasn't happened. And I fear for the state of democracy if we don't just get Brexit uh, done in the best possible way with a close partnership uh, with the EU. Uh, I think cancelling the referendum, just annulling it, uh, why would anyone vote ever again? Uh, I think a second referendum would just continue the, the chaos. The, the, the choice we have at this, um, at this election is basically between uh, a Conservative majority government and a hung parliament. Because Joe Swinson is not going to be Prime Minister, despite the fact he's leafleted every household in the constituency saying she's the next Prime Minister. Uh, and if you listen to the pollsters, uh, they say Labour actually has virtually no chance of winning an outright majority uh, because it can't win the seats in Scotland. Uh, so that is the choice between a conservative majority government or a hung parliament. And a hung parliament will, call, will continue the chaos. It might lead to a second general election, like we had in 1974. We had two general elections. The February one didn't resolve one, so we had one again in October. Personally, I can't bear the thought of another general election. Uh, or uh, you end up with uh, the Lib Dems putting Jeremy Corbyn into, into power and voting Lib Dem, and you end up with uh, Jeremy Corbyn. And that is the fundamental choice that we face uh, in this constituency. About positive, uh, about the local issues that I'm campaigning on, I've been really trying to focus on those issues, but it's got more and more difficult. Certainly, once the election was called, before Brexit happened, uh, the number one local issue is uh, about transport uh, and the consequences of over, what I call overdevelopment, huge amounts of new housing. We do need new housing, but it's pumped very rapidly. Our transport system is creaking, our roads are blocked. We need to improve public transport, railways. Rail, uh, railways, uh, the, the uh, buses, cycleways, and also upgrade the roads. Uh, housing, there's a lot of housing development that's disturbing an awful lot of communities, uh, transforming villages into towns against the wishes of local people. And I think we need to just slow down uh, a little bit. But I think it's very important that we fight this election uh, on with a positive view for <coughs> the constituency and for the country. I'd be absolutely humbled to serve the constituency that I grew up in, where I know, uh, know so many different people. And I'd urge you to, for the sake of the country, to vote for Conservatives. I'm sure there's a Conservative majority government and we don't end up with more chaos and with Chairman Corbyn in number 10. Thank you. Okay, so we can um, turn to our first group of questions, which will all uh, there are two batches of questions on the environment generally um, and climate change. Um, so our first four questions, if we could take them each in turn, if they're here, from Elspeth, Claire, Tian, and Ben. Thank you all for coming and letting us see you. Um, it's great to have the evidence of all the different body languages. <laughs> At every level of political power, from the United Nations to the Parish Council, a state of climate emergency is now universally acknowledged. This issue is more important than party politics or your own career. I would like to hear from each candidate what they will actually be doing about this on the 1st of January 2020. They are in government. We need a tough, unified plan that goes beyond what we can do as individuals. Where are the signs for us to see that any of you are going to act with the necessary urgency to challenge the concept of continual capitalist growth and to restrain the industries which pollute? We need wise, calm heads. The House is on fire. It looks as if we're losing the battle against climate change. Could you tell us what your party policies are to combat climate change? And specifically, whether you think the measures are enough? Um, last week, the Prime Minister said that global warming is a primitive fear without foundation. <laughs> <laughs> this week, the Secretary General of the United Nations said we are close to the point of no return to take action on climate change. Which one is lying? It is not. His, his question was, central government has been slow, not enacted to respond to climate change. 
What specific plans do you have for decarbonising South Cambridgeshire to mitigate climate change? And what are the time frames to achieve your plans? Um, if possible, we we'll ask for about a minute each, um, and we'll rotate the questions, but in this case, why don't we start with Matty? Very, very good questions, and I'm glad these are the, the first questions. Um, so I, when I was uh, younger, I volunteered for uh, environment groups, both in America and in uh, the UK, uh, Friends of the Earth. I, uh, well, my interest in environment led me to be environment editor of the uh, Times newspaper and the Observer newspaper. I think I'm the only person in Britain who's been environment correspondent for, uh, journalist for two national newspapers. Uh, I'm probably certainly the only Conservative candidate, possibly only MP candidate, who's actually been on uh, Greenpeace, Greenpeace's Rainbow Warrior in the Arctic Ocean looking at the impact of climate change. Climate change is real, it's a crisis, uh, we need to deal with it. Uh, it is, uh, we have an absolute moral obligation to pass on to our children, I've got uh, children, uh, a world uh, that is sustainable, that is fit for them to live in. Uh, and it'd be a, a real tarnish on our generation if we can't look at them and say, well, we did. Uh, we do that bit. I do my own bit in my own little way. All, all the electricity I have at home is renewable. I drive an electric uh, hybrid car, uh, so I'm not trying to carbon, carbon offset things. Um, the we need. It is a transformation of the economy that we need, and we need to decarbonise the economy. Uh, we need to move past the internal combustion engine. There are uh, you know, the government has proposed to uh, ban that by uh, 2040. Maybe we can accelerate that. It's good that electric technology is uh, electric car technology is advancing rapidly. Uh, we need to move beyond uh, um, uh, the uh, gas boilers in houses when we build new houses, start installing uh, electric boilers. We need to encourage more uh, public transport, as I said in my uh, opening comments. Uh, we need to insulate homes uh, far more than we do uh, at the moment. And the, as we decarbonise the economy, the electricity we produce uh, has to be uh, renewable, at least uh, carbon, carbon neutral. Uh, and we have made good progress on that. When I was writing about climate change issues 20 years ago, uh, the wind energy was about 1%, renewable energy was about 1% of that total electricity. We're now up to about 35% in the UK, and that is fantastic uh, progress. We clearly need to go far, far further, uh, and our service for uh, efforts to, to go far further. We have, as in the government has adopted, the Conservative Party have adopted the uh, IPCC recommendation of going carbon neutral by 2050. <coughs> Uh, personally, I'd like to see whether we can be more uh, ambitious on, uh, than that. I think we should be able to. But there's only so much we can do as, as one country. Our emissions are down. Uh, in fact, the whole of uh, the EU's emissions are down over the last 20 years. As indeed is uh, America's emissions are falling, which is uh, some, uh, a slight surprise. Uh, the real reason why emissions are carrying on rising is because they're rising so rapidly in China and India and uh, and other parts of the world. And that means that we cannot do this alone. And having international cooperation is incredibly important. And I would use our, our relations with other countries, with things like our international uh, aid budget, to help uh, emerging economies develop uh, or adopt uh, green uh, carbon neutral technologies so we can encourage the whole world to become uh, carbon neutral uh, together at the same time. This is a crisis. We have to deal with it. And it would be absolutely top of mind uh, to do this if I were elected. <laughs> right, so to address those questions in particular, because you raised some really interesting points, and something I think you said, Elspeth, which I think is really important is uh, we need a tough, unified plan that goes beyond what we can do as individuals. And I think for the last 20 years we've seen what we as individuals can try and do to try and change our lives. And of course there is a big responsibility for us to do that. But clearly, there's no joined up thinking, there's no economic plan which will make the difference that we need. And at the moment, we are sliding, as I said at the beginning, into a catastrophe. So the two degrees increase, if that happens, we know that over 90% of life on Earth will be severely affected. There will be huge areas such as the Delta in Bangladesh, where there will be a massive refugee crisis from the 7 to 10 million people affected by flooding. So this has to be on a, a global scale. And, and I think we have to be the country that leads the way on this with other European and also other neighbours around the world. And the key challenge here is how can we change our economy to being a green economy? And that is kind of one of the key features of the, the Labour Manifesto. So I was talking to Natalie Bennett about two years ago, and she came to Cambridge. Um, I interviewed her at Cambridge 105 as a volunteer. And she was just describing an example of the waste that we have in our society, where supermarkets you know, have a huge amount of food that's thrown away. The carbon footprint for the food that we eat in our supermarkets is massive. And she said just that one sector alone needs to be reformed. 
But this goes into so many areas, the way the source of energy that we have, it's the kind of economy that we run. And so what we're saying is straight away on the 1st of January, I'd be working for the legislation to get through to make sure that we are having green jobs and investment in place and the investment fund of £250 billion to make sure we can change the way the economy works. That includes decarbonising the atmosphere with tree planting over a billion trees. But equally, I was talking to a scientist in Cambridge only uh, two weeks ago who was talking about the technology they're working on to actually take carbon out of the air now. Because we clearly <coughs> can't wait for tree growth. We have to do something instantly. And that's something we'd invest money into. And all the technologies that we do put money into, we would then want to make sure we share that with the rest of the world, particularly the developing world, for free. Because actually, what I find disgraceful is when you hear that we are meeting our climate targets or we're meeting our obligations because we are offsetting our carbon in the rest of the world, as if somehow that's okay because it's good in the headlines. This is a real problem. It's not a political problem. It's an actual world problem. And if we don't work with the rest of the world, then we are going to face that crisis and suit. And to say that it's Brexit will fix it is rubbish. This is something that's revolution Congress. Come to the next points. I hope Claire has mentioned what you said there because you said about losing the battle on climate change. You're right, and we have to now make that change now. This is probably the first and I would suggest the last climate election we're going to face. If we don't make the change now, it's going to be too late. About Ian, you, you said primitive fear without foundation. I know you don't have a microphone now. I'd like to know the context the Prime Minister said that. Two articles, one in June two. Yep. in the Telegraph and one last week in the Telegraph. You look them up. No, I'm, I'm but that draws in, yeah. you'll see. He, it, was, it was just simply lambasting it. He was, he was saying that uh, we had to rely on the Maunder cycle to sort out the our climate, which apparently only affects our climate by 0.1 of a degree. Right, OK. Um, and, and, and basically, he's talking to some nutty scientist. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't mention that point, Anthony. I don't know if you ever want to come back on it. But I, I find it shocking that the science is being questioned because um, I studied through general chronology the Holocene and Pleistocene periods in our history, uh, well, in our prehistory as well. And clearly, there is a pattern of world climate change, but this is beyond anything we've seen before. And the pattern is clearly showing that we are heading to crisis and catastrophe. So t he is, I don't think he's lying. Uh, I don't know his motivation, but he's seriously wrong, isn't he? Uh, and untruthful, which is obviously out of character for our Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and finally, so the government is slow to of, uh, often uh, inactive to respond to climate change. Um, yes, it has, because uh, in many ways, I think the pledges, so well, our pledge is to virtually be completely carbon zero by 2030 as best we can. Uh, it's not an easy target. crisis it's a government that has to step up to take that decision so we're prepared to do that i fear that 2045 2050 is pushing off to another generation uh, to say to them in the future this is your problem now you're in office you deal with it sorry so it's not good enough it has to be far sooner i hope i've addressed all those questions individually thank you If there is further audience participation, that's great, and I guess we'll give you a chance to respond. So, the question is on having a realistic, credible plan. You've heard both Anthony and Dan acknowledge the seriousness of the problem, and I acknowledge that too. And Dan is absolutely right. The Prime Minister is wrong. <laughs> but we have to work with what we already what we already have. So we acknowledge the scale of the problem. We need to acknowledge the scale of the solution. I got to know a very tiny bit, David Mackay at, at the Cavendish, who was the who brought a lot of attention to the climate debate. Wrote a very good book called Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air. He had this great quote that if we all do a little, we'll just achieve a little. Um, we need to do a lot, and it is the responsibility of government to do a lot. But the, we need to look at what's credible. So, for example, one of the Liberal Democrat policies is insulating every home in the UK 
to get it up to a standard that would have a big impact on our emissions. That 30 million homes, and we propose doing that in 10 years, that is not a small, easy thing to do. And there are many other examples, for example, electric cars we talked about, or Anthony mentioned. The fact is, phasing out, phasing out petrol and diesel car sales by 2040 isn't fast enough. But at the same time, as the Liberal Democrat target is to do that by 2030, that is still a massive challenge to introduce the charging infrastructure for electric cars and the and supporting the grid to do that. It's a big challenge. And we're planning based on existing technology. <coughs> we may have new technology come along as people invest more in trying to solve the climate crisis. But that's no basis on which to plan. And Although Dan mentions the Labour 2030 target, that was a target that the conference agreed. It didn't appear in the manifesto of 2030, sometime in the 2030s. And the reason that they made that is because it's not clear. The focus of Labour is on renationalisation, which to my mind is a huge waste of time and effort and money that could be invested directly into solving the climate crisis investing directly into renewables. So there's a target to get to 80% renewable gen electricity generation by, by 2030 again. So we'll get a long way, a 75% reduction by 2030, but let's acknowledge the scale of the problem. Some other specific policies to mention, uh, we're the only party that commit to no net expansion of, of uh, runways, at airports, so we would cancel the Heathrow expansion because that isn't, again, that is not a technology that we have an electric solution for yet. There's a lot of research going on there, but we aren't going to solve that by 2030. So we need to reduce passenger numbers or, or limit passenger numbers, I should say. And we need to make sure that the people that are flying the most are paying more for it. So <coughs> the, frequent, the frequent flyer tax is another one of our proposals. Um, so I, I, that gives you a flavour. There's a lot more in our, in, our, in our manifesto on this. But I will just stress that it, it is that level of detail that gives you the credibility of the plan. Um, in terms of the, the other questions. Um, I think the, there was a question on the uh, influencing the other parts of the world. Was that? We'll come on to that in a second. Was that? Okay. So, so it, it, from the four questions so far, any further response to the candidates who will then be allowed to respond to it? Yeah, Ian. I, I just I feel I point out that most of, of the Conservatives and I think Labour, I'm not sure about the sort of Democrats, are relying on carbon capture as part of their <coughs> model to reduce the carbon emissions we're reducing. And they're relying on biofueled carbon capture. I was at the IPCC conference uh, Monday last, Monday last week, and it was thoroughly trashed. It, there isn't a scientific basis for biofueled carbon capture, I'm afraid. At least not at the moment. So I think you might have to be right here. Thank you. Well, my, my background training is science as well, and clearly any uh, solution has to be based on sound science. And uh, I was very struck when I was uh, in Brahma Jones uh, about the number of proposals, different policies that aren't based on sound science. Uh, I have been Firstly, skeptical about uh, biofuels for all, so all sorts of different reasons, not least the impact they often have on the, this comes to the next question, but uh, habitat loss in the, uh, in the developing world. Um, we, uh, carbon capture is, I think, for everyone, it's going to be part of the solution. I think we've all got policies for planting trees, for example, which I don't think any of us just mentioned, but that's uh, I mean, the most natural form of, uh, of carbon capture. We've got a policy, a set of policies, for 30,000 hectares uh, a year as trees grow. 
photos they, they take carbon dioxide uh, out of out of the atmosphere and store it uh, in trees. And in fact, the whole if you go back to the geological time, the whole creation of coal was a form of natural uh, carbon capture. And clearly, you know, we can't wait for that. It is part of the mix, but actually, we need, the main focus has to be on uh, uh, using less energy in terms of uh, uh, conservation, but also in terms of producing renewable energy and carbon zero energy. Yeah, you're right to raise that issue, um, because if it's a case of just taking carbon out of the air, but already reducing the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere in the first place, then clearly that's not a solution. Uh, but I want to just, just um, refresh your uh, opinion, maybe, of the manifesto, because actually it's about the investment we put into renewable energy sources. So, for instance, in South Wales, we want to have a tidal lagoon built uh, as a way to make energy that way. It's the increase in things like um, you know, wind turbine production, which is a huge as well. What we're saying is we need to have an economic change, not just replace oil with another type of fuel, but actually how it can change the whole economy and its energy production. But actually, you raise the other point in, in a way from what you say is, is about the, the world scale of the problem because China is building so many coal power stations right now uh, that we have to find ways to, to work with the world to make them change. We just have to. And I, I think I just kind of come back to what's been raised by the or is that not enough? Yes. Yeah. So in terms of the scale of, of the problem, as Ian said, um, if we have a banking crisis, and we've had that in our lifetime, then we don't talk about in sort of the next 50 or 60 years, we'll find a solution to that crisis. If we face uh, an existential crisis like a war, we don't talk about trying to find the next half a century to try and work out to defend ourselves. We find resources and we do it now. So by saying there's a scale of the problem, but it's just not feasible for 50 years, or however long, I don't think it's a credible answer, and I think that means you don't actually understand how bad the actual crisis is. And in terms of insulating homes, the last day the government had a policy whereby all new homes would not need to be insulated because, in actual fact, they would already be at the stage where they'd be saving energy bill uh, the money, for, sorry, uh, saving bill money from the people living them because they'd be cutting down their energy bills in the first place. It's because we have deregulation of those policies we face this now. So if you don't take this seriously now, you'll be paying way more in the future to try and undo the damage you're doing. Hence why it's actually economically be better and makes sense to step in now with a real radical plan. So specifically on carbon capture and storage, um, I agree. There's no commercially viable uh, proposal anywhere in the world. And it has been has been tried and always gets gets taken. <coughs> that said, there are some industries that are incredibly difficult to decarbonize. Steel, cement, they're very, very challenging. And we don't have ideas on them, on them yet. And that's part of the reason why <coughs> we say it's not credible to say that this, this is gone in twenty thirty unless we we're saying that we don't want those industries anymore. Well, uh, we need we need steel and cement. So there are tech we can look at uh, uh, innovation in those, maybe using hydrogen or maybe using carbon capture and storage. But getting from an idea right now to a commercially viable solution, it, you can't plan. Uh, excuse me. You can't plan on that basis. So the 2045 target that the Liberal Democrats propose is based on what we can achieve with our detailed proposals. It's not fairy dreams or unicorns. We've had enough of unicorns the last three years. This is what we can achieve with what we have now. Should we go farther and faster? Absolutely, absolutely. But we can't plan on that if we don't know what the technologies are that are going to deliver it. So we, we push for innovation, we invest in innovation. <coughs> And we find those other solutions, but we don't plan on somebody's dreams. Thanks very much. Okay, our second group of questions. Oh, sorry, third part. We didn't I, see may I say one more thing? Point. Uh, just to pick up on what Ian said about, and all of you, I think, being focusing on technological solutions to the problem, which are obviously part of it, but don't we also need um, behavioural change? Uh, 
not as individual. I mean, beyond as individuals, how are you? How is any politician going to persuade us to stop, to go slower, to actually consume less? Is, is that is that the is that part of the answer? And can you persuade anyone of that? Could you uh, please explain what you can do to reduce the vast amounts of plastic that we consume in the UK? Thank you. And the second question is, as well as the climate crisis, we're in a biodiversity crisis. This year, a UN Beck report found that around 1 million species globally are threatened with extinction, and the recent UK State of Nature report found that our wildlife continues to be lost. What would your policy priorities be to protect our nature for future generations? In what way will policy on climate change influence your party's stance in trade negotiations with countries such as USA, Brazil and Malaysia? And I ask this question specifically because I've seen a lot of kowtowing to Donald Trump and talk about free trade, and specifically that the British trade negotiators who went talking about a post-Brexit trade treaty, uh, treaty in Malaysia didn't raise the question of palm oil, and in Brazil they didn't talk about the uh, damage to the Amazon. There is no linkage in the policies which this government have put into practice when they go talking to other countries. Right, so the, um, the first question there about the consumption, um, how do we change the pace and pattern? Um, now I personally, so but I personally try, if I can, to only eat fruits and vegetables in season in the country. Because my dad, my, my, my grandfather, was a gardener and stayed home, and he used to grow all the vegetables. And of course, I got used to that from my dad, as tradition we have. I think people have to realise having your asparagus flown in from the other side of the planet, or your flowers grown in Africa where people don't have access to water, or your flowers being watered. Uh, is not only bad for the environment, it's also a social injustice as well. So we have to be very realistic about those things. And our lives will not get worse because of it, really. Think about it. These are not going to make us starve, we're not going to suffer. We just have to reset our expectations in the, in the world. And secondly, when it comes to flying, now, Caroline Lucas was talking about this, and I thought she was really honest, and I've got a lot of time for Caroline Lucas. She said she flew to America to see her son. I think we understand that's okay. That's fine. You, you need to see your family. But it's the difference between where you can travel and where you have to travel, and where you, of course, don't have to, but you do, by air. And I think we're going to change the way the patterns that we work. And technology is a huge part of that. So I worked in an organisation uh, in a social enterprise, and we were working with communities in Africa, South America, and Asia to try and make their communities better. We worked on environmental projects. So we had a pledge as an organisation to give our carbon footprint down by using technology as much as we could to communicate. Fewer meetings in person and much more online, and those things are possible. And I know from my friends in the Green Party, their meetings are done through Skype and other programs. So you know it is possible to do. Um, with regards to the other issue, plastic is a massive worry, and um, my wife is is more on to this than I am. So she tried to get rid of all plastics as much as she could, but still, the number of plastic, the amount of plastics we're used in packaging is through the roof, and that could change. It could change. So, you know, moving towards cardboard <laughs> paper, those kinds of options would be much more sensible. Uh, wax paper instead of plastic coated paper because plastic is in everything. Um, and equally, it worries me. If you look at BPA, for instance, which is really dangerous to the environment and also to ourselves, it's banned by the European Union in children's uh, life, for instance, using plastic. They probably have BPA in. I don't know what you're doing to us. But <laughs> if that was for a child, it would be made illegal. For an adult, it's not. And we know there's huge health risks associated with this as well. And from my studies of the past, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, I honestly think that this is the carbon and plastic age. And those two things we have to change as soon as possible. Government is the way to do that through legislation. So it's something that I would certainly take seriously. About biodiversity, um, that, that in a very particular way, I wanted to raise it this evening. Um, I, I mentioned that in my opening speech about biodiversity. But particularly in this area, we know there's a report in The Guardian about, I think, January, February last year, about the numbers of bugs and insects going down. <laughs> Uh, in our region, and of course we know it's been pesticides, damage to their habitat. But equally, the thing I do want to raise is the water crisis that we don't talk about enough in this region right now. And if you're not aware, the chalk rivers are running dry, the aquifer is in a real mess, and after the wettest October we've had for many, many years, it's still dangerously low. 
What that means is the biodiversity along those chalk rivers, and if they're dry for maybe more than three or four years, the water won't come back necessarily in the same place. So the biodiversity in those areas is massively affected. And if we don't make housing a priority in the way we do housing, where we develop the amount of development, but more importantly, the type of water efficiency in housing, then we're going to just end up in a catastrophe locally. So we must address that. I am particularly interested in food, and I don't know if you know the history behind, behind palm oil and why it was used in all products. It was to do with a change in the scientific belief in how to preserve food uh, in a way that was seen as being healthy. There are actually other saturated fats which do the job just as well, and scientists say we should move towards those. But as palm oil is so cheap right now, there's no incentive because, and this comes up a lot, short-term profit motive doesn't work. If you want to save the environment, and make a big profit for your shareholders, the two things don't work, and understandably, the orangutans miss out, and their environment gets destroyed. So I honestly believe that we have to change from palm oil as soon as possible. It's in almost every single uh, item of uh, food, it's in most makeup, it's in virtually everything right now, and it's destroying huge swathes of the rainforest. And with regards to the last point, that does kind of come into the, the trade deal. The Labour deal on Brexit is that we have a very close single market and customs union, which doesn't mean we have to get a new trade deal. I believe we should remain anyway, and in the European Union we are far stronger at, as a 28 members working together as a bloc to really fight for what we believe in the world. It's what we've done for many, many decades now, we're very good at it. And the European Union is probably the best in the world at trying to stand up for these standards. If we start going down the routes where America's standards are based on short-term profit, we know, for instance, in our food, things like quality chicken, the lowering of standards there, that is not something that I want for this country. And I worry, as a small country in the world, that we will be degraded in some way and always begging for a trade deal and accepting anything that comes because of desperation. That really is my fear. So let's get the people's vote. Let's then fight for Remain. But if we don't win that, I really hope we do win that, at least our trade deal is not going to be on the same basis as the Johnson's trade deal. It's going to be aligned with the single market and the standards of the European Union. To come back on Elspeth's point, I think that there, there is a problem with growth that's based solely on consumption. And consumption and debt, pretty much. Um, but I do think there is a different, different way, and growth based on innovation. We're in the home of ideas at near <coughs> one of the world's major universities, and growth through innovation is possible, I believe, without destroying the environment. And in fact, it can help to improve the environment. Um, on plastics, I mean, let's, we can all acknowledge how terrible the situation is. Let's talk about specifics. So it does need legislation to, to create targets for, for stopping single-use plastics. Um, I can't remember the exact, I think it's within five years, so we have one parliament, but I don't, I, I'll go and check that the manifesto. Um, but it's also, again, about have, it's not just setting a target, it's about having a plan to get there. So let's, uh, you know, let's have uh, consistent uh, deposit schemes for, 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 packa for packaging, for bottles, um, and, and let's get those, those up and operating, for example. Let's, let's invest in getting the, the new forms of packaging out there. They've been developed in the university, so they, they are there. But there's a lot of inconsistency in labelling, a lot of people are confused about how to recycle certain, certain, certain plastics. But we just need to get the single-use plastics out of the system altogether and, and reuse whatever else we can. And that it's, a, it's a legislative route to do that. We know what we need to do. Um, on the biodiversity crisis, uh, I, I believe the Liberal Democrats are the only party at this uh, election proposing a Nature Act akin to the Climate Act to set into law what we need to achieve in terms of biodiversity targets and other, uh, other aspects of our natural environment. 
related to water, soil quality. And within that, we can do we can do much more to reform uh, the way that farming subsidies operate to in encourage farmers to farm in the in the in the ways that improve biodiversity. And there's lots of good examples in this part of the world. Of, of farmers taking forward those kinds of practices. We need to make sure that those all farmers are taking forward those, those kinds of practices. Um, and finally, on using the, the influence around the world, um, the Brexit is a climate issue. We have a lot more power as part of those twenty as part of those twenty eight member states of the EU to influence other countries through trade in their, in their approach, whether it's to the Amazon rainforest, whether it's to palm, palm oil. The EU is a major trading bloc, and we have the, if we're at the table, we can influence within in the EU, and we can influence the rest of the world much more effectively. The, the UK can lead on this issue, but it won't do if it's outside of the EU. If it, we're outside of the EU, we will, the approach will be to deregulate, which will lower standards. So we will go in the opposite direction. Thank you. Um, is that it? Elspeth's question first. I don't know how many people know that Elspeth is. She's a very well known potter, she makes wonderful pots. Into the DNA, I think, and there's an absolutely exemplary lifestyle. Um, unfortunately, I don't think the rest of the population, or much of the rest of the population, live as exemplary lifestyle as, uh, as elsewhere. Um, the, we do need people to take uh, more, uh, use their own personal decisions in their own personal life to be more uh, sort of climate friendly. As I mentioned, you know, I deliberately chosen renewable electricity. But we're only, and I would definitely encourage people to do that. And so one of the good things, we did a um, Extinction Rebellion hustings, the first one we did. Uh, and whatever we think about Extinction Rebellion, one thing they and Greta Thunberg have done is raise the profile, the fiscal profile, the priority of climate change. And I think more people will be. will be adjusting their lifestyle as a result. But one thing I, I know, we know, is you cannot just rely on voluntary action by individuals. It does require government action. It does require uh, international action. Uh, and uh, that's what we, we, we covered earlier. So I, I would actually encourage people to do it. But we are at the from the government action. Um, the, on the plastic, uh, yeah, I, I see plastic as a um, uh, so in, single use plastic as a sort of intermediate technology as well. Plastic is a byproduct of the, um, uh, of the oil industry. It is uh, incredibly cheap, or sort of unnaturally cheap as a result, and used uh, extensively in a way that, from an economist's point of view, and as an economist correspondent with the BBC and Observer, they would say that the externalities aren't priced in. Like you, you are, when you have single use plastic, you're not paying for all the cost of uh, actually getting rid of that plastic at the end. It's not priced in. Uh, and so it's a market failure, and I think you, you, that means you need government action. And things that we have done are uh, introduce a tax on uh, um, the uh, plastic bags for uh, larger shops. Uh, that's now being extended to all shops and increased uh, to 10p. I think that's what the coalition actually has done. Uh, we've banned, uh, the Conservative government's banned microbeads in uh, cosmetics and shampoos and so on, which uh, again is the only way to do it is to ban it because there's no market mechanism there, it's a market failure. And I think actually what you do, you, the only way to uh, take account of the fact that single use plastics do have such bad environmental consequences is through government action, it's not going to be through, uh, through any other way. Um, and also international action, because as we know, like plastic bags uh, in the oceans, for example, I think 90% of them come from outside uh, the, uh, the EU and the US, and it'll only, we'll only have re all the stuff that we saw the day without the blue planet, it'll only have a real impact on that if, uh, if uh, countries, particularly in Asian countries, reduce the, the amount of plastic they put in the oceans. And I'd absolutely try and work with those other countries to try and do that. Um, the, uh, biodiversity crisis, yes, absolutely. In my years as an environment correspondent, I uh, reported extensively on biodiversity loss. And one of the things I felt very acutely in this country is how much we have lost our uh, natural environment. You think animals that used to be here, we had uh, uh, beavers here until the 13th century, we had wolves here until the uh, 17th century. Uh, and uh, beavers are now being reintroduced, actually, in the, in the UK, in, in uh, Scotland. So uh, wild boar have been reintroduced. It's quite a movement for rewilding. I think there's a lot we can do to 
uh, really wild. But one, one of the things I feel quite acutely, as somebody who's uh, half Norwegian and spent my summers in the woods of Norway, is how few trees we have in the UK as a whole, so, and in particular in Cambridgeshire. So we have 3% tree cover in Cambridge. Uh, in Cambridgeshire, which is the pretty much the lowest in the UK. The UK average is about 11%. The European average is about 30, 35%. So we've got about a third of the tree cover here as other European countries. Uh, and in Cambridgeshire in particular, we've got about a quarter of the UK average. It's great agricultural land. But I would really support this fact that the first sort of campaign thing I did is measures to uh, boost uh, tree planting. And that is uh, good for uh, climate. It's good particularly for uh, if you have the right trees good for nature, it creates the habitats that uh, uh, wildlife can wildlife can live in. And we've got basically uh, all, all that part is committed to tree planting. We have got a six hundred million pounds uh, nature for climate fund that I would work as uh, MP to try and make sure that much of that is used to uh, plant trees that are uh, uh, I mean, in Cambridge, but also more widely, you've got to give incentives to landowners to plant trees. They're not going to do it just for, uh, uh, out of virtue. Um, we absolutely have to do that. Uh, on the trade negotiations point, so what, one observation here, which uh, um, is in all our uh, hustings, we've been asked about trade policy. I think it's fantastic that MPs or want to be MPs uh, can talk about trade policy because one of the things with Brexit is. Uh, within the EU, we could actually talk about trade policy because it was an EU uh, conference of the and there were no debates in Parliament about what sort of trade policy was. I certainly think we should have a trade policy that does prioritise higher environmental standards, so I'd absolutely support that. The EU is, finds it very difficult to negotiate trade agreements because you've got to get agreement of all 28 different countries. They're not part of negotiations, they're constant standards, they do have to sign it off at the end of the process. We don't have a trade deal with America, for example. The EU has no trade deal with America, there's no trade deal with China. It's too difficult to negotiate or has proven to negotiate. When, when, we are, uh, when we leave the EU, it will be a lot easier to negotiate trade deals because we're one country doing it rather than 28 countries. And it's up to us, up to the MPs you elect, up to Parliament, to decide what those standards are in those trade deals. And uh, uh, Ian was saying, we'll be about to regulation. I can't see why it should be. I think the, uh, what matters is that Parliament will be able to set the standards and say, and I certainly think that actually having higher environmental standards when we negotiate with Malaysia and Brazil and, and the US, having higher environmental standards or animal welfare standards, that will be up to the Parliament to decide. The Parliament will say, yes, we want those higher standards there, and I would certainly urge that. Any response from our questioners? Or should we move on to our next? How do you think you're going to get the Conservative government to change that policy? Because the evidence we have when they were in government was that they did not follow that policy, they didn't make the linkage. Which, which sorry, I talked about that. Which, 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 which policy was not bringing climate issues into the discussions with Brazil um, and palm oil issues into the discussions with Malaysia, and both when they were talking about post-Brexit trade <coughs> policy, the negotiators did not take up these questions. So the, the track record is of ignoring the climate impact. That's why I asked the question. Uh, so, I, I mean, I don't know that we haven't actually started negotiating trade deals with these countries, so there, 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 there's been nothing in there. Uh, Liam Fox has been paid to do something. <laughs> We yeah, I mean, it's, it's not it's sort of pre-negotiations. It's not actually we haven't started formal negotiations. We're not allowed to do it until we leave uh, the EU. So all, it, all I'd say is that certainly, if I was elected as your representative, I would certainly uh, push to have climate change in particular as part of uh, trade deals. Thank you. So, so, so um, yeah, it's about the, the trade negotiation deal. So um, you, you go with your priorities to those first initial talks, don't you? And if you don't take the environment with you, then that shows it's not a priority. So I'd suggest it should have been talked about, and it wasn't. But this talk that somehow Britain will be in a position to put up red lines when it's negotiating with the rest of the world, I think we've been here before with the Tory Prime Minister saying about red lines, and they soon got thrown away, and now we potentially have a customs union border down the Irish Sea. Um, certainly, Theresa May had to kind of row back on her red lines as well. And just in terms of the mathematics of this, so we would, we would be obviously equal partners in trade negotiations with the other countries in the world in some ways, but in other ways, just by scale of the economy, we wouldn't. And the best analogy of that is foreign policy. Our foreign policy is very much directed by other bigger countries in the world and how we work with them. 
And in the same way we have to compromise sometimes on foreign policy, we would also have to do the same with trade negotiations. And it was only uh, this morning, as you've seen uh, on um, the pharmaceutical uh, lobby in America, was talking very strongly about trying to readdress the imbalance, as they see it, and the unfairness in the setting of, for instance, drug prices to the UK, because they think we get it far too cheaply. So us saying, this is a red line, that's it. We know that a trade deal would be about compromise. And I fear the Conservative government does not prioritise the environment in this issue. And it would be a case of, that's one thing we can compromise on because we want access to the banks or whatever else. So I just, I just question that and say that Tory red lines are not as trustworthy as they make out. And secondly, I don't think that we'd be compromising the ways that we can afford to. But to take the first three questions first, which are individually to candidates and should therefore be answered in the order in which they've been given, so Anthony, Ian and, and Dan. Um, the first question is from Yorick, and the second two questions are from Fran, who I don't think is here, so I will read them out for her. My question was for Anthony Brown. How will you, if elected, handle the serious matter of trust in our politics when Boris Johnson will be number two as the most renowned liar in the world today behind Donald Trump? Um, this, this question is to Ian. Um, despite your local polling suggesting that you are neck and neck with Conservatives, history shows that this has been a parliamentary Conservative seat for over 40 years with the Lib Dems coming third in two out of the three last general elections. Is it misleading to portray such a close race in all your literature citing <coughs> non-general election statistics? <laughs> and the third question is from Fran to Dan, and is the manifesto commitment to nationalisation is sweeping and potentially extremely costly. Looking specifically at the proposed state-run pharmaceutical manufacturing facility, do you really believe that this is credible in the light of the significant expertise and capitalisation that would be required to do this? So, going first to Yorick's question to answer. Um, thank you, Yorick. And I should point out, Yorick is one of the people who's known me since I was a child. Um, the, I think trust in politics is incredibly important. And it's one thing that's really been driven home to me as I've been canvassing for the last four months, knocking on doors across the constituency, is just how low the trust has gone. And, and uh, I find it shocking, I find it upsetting. I also understand the frustration that the uh, public have with it. And the uh, politicians as a whole have uh, not covered themselves with glory uh, so, you know, in, in recent years, and certainly in the last, uh, last few years, all the shenanigans that have been going on uh, in Parliament. And politics has become a lot more hostile business. And there's the whole uh, social media thing that puts a huge amount of pressure on politicians to uh, perform in, in various ways or to... Uh, uh, be very defensive in various ways. It's it's become a lot more um, uh, twenty four hour news cycles that have become uh, you know almost a sort of tyranny for politicians. It's a completely different thing from thirty years ago, where politicians could sort of say something with more integrity. It would, it would sort of happen as it were, and would be be true. It didn't get pulled to pieces in lots of different ways. Uh, I think. I think the best thing you can do is, uh, as a politician, I certainly, one of the things I really want to do, and it's got more emphasized over the last um, four months, is behave with real integrity and in a way that people can, can trust and not, um, uh, not you know, say, saying things that you know not to be true. Not, uh, uh, I've consciously not attacked any of my opponents in this. I don't, in this election, I think it's uh, damaging when politicians actually spend all their time attacking other politicians. It just de degrades the whole... Uh, the whole process, and I don't think the public uh, particularly like it. Um, and uh, I think, you know, judge me on on how I behave. There's, very, there's various ways uh, that I think that can that can be done in uh, when we get there uh, after election, if I am elected. And it really is just making sure that you are what you say is true. Make sure you always behave with dignity. Make sure you always behave in a way that you'll be. Uh, proud of uh, looking at back in future years, and I look at—I know an awful lot of politicians, and I know I've got a lot of friends who've gone into politics, uh, and it is a brutal business, and it is shocking, uh, and, and people's behaviour does change over time. And I really want to um, really want to stop that. Uh, you'll see, uh, have a big dig at Boris and uh, Donald Trump. I can't speak for Donald Trump. Uh, the uh, Boris, I did work with him. One year as mayor of London, I just say that actually I found him to be a, a good person. I know there's going to be, you're not going to be convinced by this. He's a good person. He's uh, 
Uh, he's got an incredibly big, generous heart, and he is uh, one of the reasons I voted for him to be party leader, uh, as opposed to Jeremy Hunt, who's also a fine person and would make a great peacetime prime minister, uh, is that uh, Boris has a fantastic can-do attitude and a great <coughs> optimistic uh, uh, outlook that is uh, great at mobilising people, and I felt that is what the country needed, uh, needed at the moment. But I think, certainly, if I'm elected, I will be one of my course of themes Cutting across everything is restoring trust and integrity in politics. Yeah, so Fran isn't here, but um, she's actually she's actually been uh, generous. It's it, it's well over forty years um, since there was a change in. Uh, this, this seat and its predecessor seats being held. You can actually go back and look at it, I think it was in 1950. So there is a problem in the UK with the electoral system. First past the post creates safe seats and that has been bad for our politics. And the Lib Dems would like to change that. But on this particular issue, through a lot of hard work over the last three years by a huge team of volunteer activists, the Lib Dems have really taken our message out to South Cambridgeshire. And in doing so, we've, we've won control of the District Council and won by quite cons some considerable margin in the European election. And that's been based on talking to people on the doorsteps, listening to what they care about, and telling them what we think about the issues that they care about and how we can make it better. And that's why we won those elections last year. That's why we won the European elections. And that's why we are polling virtually neck and neck with the Conservatives in this election. 2017 is a considerable amount of time ago now. The political situation has changed. We have been very clear on our literature what statistics we are citing. And it's not just our own evidence, this is backed up by the, <coughs> the YouGov polling and almost all of the, the tactical vote recommendations are for the Liberal Democrats here. So, I don't accept that it's, it's misleading, um, it's, it is very clear what statistics we are using and it, it's up to you as informed voters, we make that clear, it's up to you as informed voters to go and see if tactical voting is something that you want to do to make a difference in this election because the first time ever, for the first time in ooh, 69, 69 years this seat could change hands. And I make no apologies for making a tactical voting argument. That's the consequence of a broken electoral system and we need to fix the electoral system. So the issue of nationalisation, um, and I will go into the particular pharmaceutical element as well. The argument for nationalisation, of course, is not for every industry in the whole economy, um, and we're not saying that it would be. We're talking about very particularly investing in infrastructure projects that can be run much more efficiently and effectively under the national ownership. And just to give you an example of that, just to kind of see if this rings true, if you look at, for instance, Coton and the busway, and we know the feelings around that very issue, and the fact that we don't talk about it enough, I don't think, in this room, if you look at that issue there, I'd suggest that as a piecemeal solution to a much bigger problem. And actually, if you had much more oversight as to a big strategy, which was a bit more controlled by democracy and local representatives, then I think you'd actually have a much better solution. Um, secondly, the money you invest into those projects, you'd actually get back into the system again. So you'd actually be investing in the future. And that's one thing, of course, going forward, so you're thinking about not just money you're making for that particular sector, but also what money's going back into the Treasury and how do we spend that money in the future. Now, free enterprise, I run my own business as well, by the way, and I believe that free enterprise is a good thing in certain things. Go and buy your coffee wherever you like. You get the best offer, you get the best quality, it's up to you. 
In other areas, we are in a false free market, and I have made this argument, but I'll make it quickly now. If you want to get the best water you can and out from your tap, then you could choose, I suppose, a water board from Scotland or Wales. But we know that's not the case. You don't get any choice whatsoever. Instead, you're paying for the local water authority to provide water for you. The government then steps in to plug the money into it where it's failing, and then that money's going towards its shareholders not improving the service. So the logical conclusion is, if there's not a free market that's working, it's failed, could we do it better from being run from the wallet to the ballot and being democratic? I think we could, and there's a logical argument as to why that's economically better off for the whole country. With regards to pharmaceutical, um, now it's interesting how people, um, well, Fran, Fran in particular, I don't know if you've seen this, Fran, um, said about the fact that the private sector works better in this area. Um, yes and no. So, my wife works in science at the moment. She's uh, working in a, in a lab in Cambridge University uh, trying to find a cure for cancer. That is charitably funded money that's going towards her lab. There are, of course, drugs, and there's people I know who work locally on different uh, you know, uh, pharmaceutical uh, innovations. And they tell me that we don't focus private money, for instance, into developing world diseases because they're not seen as a priority. We do into Western diseases. And what we're saying is, the Western diseases that we're putting all this money into, and as users, I don't think we get the best value for money for, because quite often the patent is, is there to try and make the price as high as possible, as long as possible. So this solution is both investing in drugs which will help the whole world with things like TB medication, and at the same time making it cheaper for us locally by replicating the drugs that are made by the big pharmaceutical companies. And by doing so, you can access them for not the massively high price they want to charge you. Polio, when the, when the, um, the, the discovery for the cure for polio was, was introduced, the man who came up with the idea said it would not have a patent on it. And it was a company that bought it and charged us a fortune and ripped us off. Or, for instance, if you look at um, other treatments, like the, treat, the cure for, pen, uh, for many types of um, bacterial infections through penicillin, there was actually a government-backed solution that had to be government-backed to find a solution. And many diseases in the world need that investment, which the private sector is not prepared to do. So the private sector will still be there, but to make the system fairer, that's where the government can step in. Okay, this, um, the next couple of questions are going to be on the NHS. Um, on your sheets, there's the one that's there on the NHS, and I think it might be worth taking the one that's under Brexit, but it's really an NHS question, so um, we'll take those two together. So the next question is just to it. It, it does, it doesn't seem quite fair. Well, we're going to we'll change the question slightly. Um, so the, the uh, first question comes from Josh, and is direct, is specifically to Anthony, but you may, get, well Josh may slightly so rewrite. Oh, well, so, and then I'll ask a second question to, to follow that up, which will be to everyone. So I guess it's more, it's more about trust again rather than, uh, rather than the NHS particularly. But in 2001, uh, you, Anthony, wrote that you felt like the NHS needed to be thrown away, that it wasn't working, uh, and that it was irreparable. Uh, and I, and, but that, that since then, there have been reforms that have meant that it's, uh, it's, it is salvageable. Um, so I'd be interested in what those reforms are, but more particularly, more generally, and this is you know, for all of you, at what point uh, uh, do we think that a politician who said something should be able to, or stood with certain people on a platform, should be able to uh, make a change and you know, have a come to Jesus moment right before an election. <laughs> okay, that's, that's the first question. And the second question is to, is to, to each of the candidates. Um, will you commit, even if you're passing a job, the Johnson bill, to have it amended such that drug pricing for the NHS is specifically kept out of any future US trade deal, as can be mandated by Parliament? Uh, so I guess Nancy should go first on on, on, uh, on So it was one of the um, slight disadvantages I had. I, I, my career has been almost entirely in the public domain for the last 30 years, and so there's uh, absolutely vast amounts that uh, people are indeed trawling over uh, to find out anything that's vaguely uh, embarrassing. Um, one of the journalists said, one, that was interviewing me said one of the problems with, with, with these two is actually they haven't had such public career, so it's actually quite difficult to, uh, to find out. I did, I was health actually observed for two years in 1999 to 2001, and one of the, um, uh, one of the things that I discovered happens as a, as a health journalist uh, is that people who are having trouble with their medical care phone you up as a last resort. So a lot of people who are having trouble 
patients who are having trouble navigating the NHS, people who were having trouble getting diagnosed, diagnosis, people who had been diagnosed for cancer, say, but they're not getting treatment for cancer, uh, people who um, uh, were, uh, didn't trust their doctor for various reasons, but actually then couldn't uh, uh, get a second opinion or go to another doctor because they didn't have the choice. Parents whose uh, children had been uh, killed by malpractice in the NHS where they weren't given any information about uh, the survival rates of different treatments, I'm thinking about the Alba Hay Hospital here, uh, where doctors knew the survival rates and wouldn't send their own children to those hospitals. And these are all really heartrending. <coughs> Uh, two years dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis and uh, it made me far more uh, convinced that actually what we need is more uh, a more patient-centered uh, NHS it's more uh, or health system that's more responsive to the needs of individual patients so the patients have more choice if you want they have more information so you have more uh, information about the, uh, the survival rates of uh, the treatment rates of different hospitals and different individual doctors uh, you have a choice to go to different uh, uh, different hospitals. You don't have this uh, postcode lottery that if you're in the catchment area of this hospital, you can get this treatment, but not that hospital, that treatment. Uh, and, uh, and also give more, uh, uh, enable patients to have more uh, stronger complaints mechanisms. And I've wrote about that uh, a lot. And again, those, those are articles that people aren't uh, pulling out. Anyway, it did get the government, the government at the time was thinking about different forms of uh, healthcare provision, and there was a big debate about it in uh, the, the French health system, which was in many ways deemed to be the best in the world. There are various international reports about it. They have a social insurance model. In fact, all other European countries largely have a social insurance model. Um, and I uh, made a contribution to that, uh, to that debate. What has changed is two things. One thing I was always really consistent about uh, is we need more funding for the NHS. And I've, I've written about that endlessly uh, over the years. Uh, and it has gone up a lot uh, over the last 20 years. So I think 20 years ago, uh, somebody will correct me if I'm wrong, but from memory, it was about 6% of GDP then. It's now about 9% of GDP. We probably need to go to about 10% of GDP. Uh, the, um, but also, a lot of reforms have empowered patients, as I was describing, far more. The, the patients have more choice, they've got more uh, agency within the NHS uh, to have control over their, uh, their different treatments. And uh, although, while as health industry observer, I speak to patients on a, a daily basis, and, and I learned a huge amount about the NHS, uh, I had what you might call a slight crisis of confidence in it. I'm completely committed. Uh, as, I think we've repeatedly clear, uh, to having universal health care that is uh, free at the point of use, that is available to everyone, rich or poor, whatever your background, uh, and taxpayer funded. And I'm totally committed to the NHS uh, now, and absolutely, if elected as your MP, I'll carry on uh, championing them. And the next, I'll let the next one as well. Um, we'll take that one second, so let Dan go yeah. on the sort of general, sort of general question. Uh, yeah, sorry, um, I'm just going to repeat myself. Um, well, it was specifically yes. so it was sort of... Can so you close by the okay, okay, yeah, 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 fine. Um, okay, yeah, I mean, okay, so to, just to just to bring up the point you raised, Anthony, about our previous experience or, you know, being the public eye, there was some degree of truth to what you say because I've not been a journalist. But at the same time, I would say there has been a culture for about 20 years or more where journalists have very much set the debate in the country, and that's what worries me sometimes. And some articles by, and I'm going to use a different example, if you think about Boris Johnson, he said clearly that when he was writing in Brussels, he was making up stories, or certainly embellishing stories, and the way he described it was, it's like throwing a stone over the wall and hearing the smash back in London and that his story was going down well. And I think that is partly contributing to the kind of climate of kind of anti-Europeanism that we saw way before the financial crisis of 2008. And I think that, that you know, those journalists have created, in some ways, those kinds of issues. Um, and I do think that can be quite damaging or worrying, because then, of course, there's this revolving door with some journalists going into politics, they set the agenda nationally, and then they benefit in some way governmentally. But at the same time, and I, I just want your comment on this one, because I know you wrote the book about mass migration, and the BNP had as a bestseller in a bookshop online. That, I think, is quite worrying, because is that setting an agenda or a tone? And, and you're here to say if that's right or wrong or whatever you think about it. But my theory is that that has created or certainly encouraged or been a catalyst for certain far right ideas. And that does worry me. So do you publicly think that they are wrong to interpret your book that way? Or is it the fact that uh, the book wasn't at, at all meaning those things? Or is it you've changed your mind from the book said? Well, just, you know, just clarification. I, I think it's your chance just to explain that for you. Would you like to respond? Yeah, I mean, so the, the book you're referring to, 
Uh, it actually also won Think Tank Publication of the Year Award by Pros the Left Wing Prospect magazine, so you can uh, interpret it in different ways. You don't, uh, you also don't, I think the BMP website, I, mean, I was absolutely horrified when, uh, when I found out that they were selling it. You have no control over it. I tried to stop it, you can't control it. Uh, and they sell a lot of, lot of different things. Uh, the, the main arguments using that book were essentially, uh, if you read it now, more sort of left wing arguments about the impact of uh, large scale, uh, very large scale immigration. So, as I say, it won, it won the left wing magazine, gave it the Think Tank publication of the Eurovolt, you can interpret it in different ways. Ian, did you have a question on this journal? Yeah, uh, just start. Uh, I mean, it, it is more, more a question of, of trust. Um, and judgment, and the things will come up over the next five years, if this parliament runs for the full five years, that aren't going to be related to anything that's in the manifesto. You're electing someone to use their judgment, informed by their values, to represent your interests. And it really is for you. Anthony does have a, a big bank to go and look at and find out what he's thought in the past. I can accept people have made mistakes. People do make mistakes. And people change their mind, and they, that's fine. What it shows about their judgment, yeah, that's for you to decide at this election. So do go and read what Anthony's written, see what you think of it, see what you think of his defense. He's perfectly able to explain it himself. So. Yes. Um, I mean, one other, just following up on the point that Dan said, is that the, the, role, the role of a journalist is very different from the role of a politician. And I, the, one, one guy came up to me in the streets a couple of days ago and said, uh, he, he voted for me, posted the vote. And he said, oh, I see people are having a pop at you because of something you wrote in The Spectator. And he said, well, if you didn't write something that was quite punchy, then they wouldn't have published it. And actually, the, the, the point of it, as a journalist, you write stuff that is more provocative and thought-provoking and so out there. As a journalist, your job, as a politician, your job is to uh, bring people together. And certainly, uh, I see myself as a, if you ask what my values are, uh, a One Nation Conservative, I always have done, that you're actually, and it's important for a Conservative government to uh, have policies and uh, messages for everyone, whatever their background, whether they're somebody who's uh, unemployed, trying to get into work, or an immigrant who's come to this country to better their lives, uh, a hard-working family trying to make ends meet, an entrepreneur who's trying to make a success uh, of his or her business. Uh, and I completely support having an open and, uh, open and tolerant society. I want a society where everyone who lives here feels comfortable here, uh, feels welcome here. Uh, and that, that is how I would uh, play my role as a politician. When I worked, um, my only other time in public service was working for City Hall, where I had a statutory duty to promote uh, diversity. Uh, and inclusion, and absolutely I did that, and, uh, and I would absolutely carry on doing that. As it happens, I'm the, uh, the, uh, the son of an immigrant, uh, the husband of an immigrant, uh, and I think I'm emphatically pro-immigration. Uh, it brings great strengths to the country, but it does need to be controlled. Okay, and, um, the second question was, uh, um, what is um, essentially about NHS pricing um, and, and a future trade deal. So on the assumption that we're a Conservative majority um, in Parliament, it, it is possible for Parliament to mandate that uh, NHS drug pricing is excluded from trade negotiations, which is a way of guaranteeing that we don't have 1,000% price increases in some of our most basic drugs. Um, would you commit, if you were RMP, um, to seek that exclusion, um, to tie the government's hands in such future trade negotiations. And um, we could go in the first order this time, so Ian Dan. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, obviously, yes, I protect the NHS. However, let's, let's be honest here. If there's a majority, we know that the majority means that the winner takes all in our system. Um, and even though I'd fight, I'd scream, I'd do everything I could, the Tories would push on ahead regardless. I don't think they would, if, if that's the direction they took, obviously. So, as an opposition MP, it's been very difficult in that situation, which is why this election is just so important. And there's no good having a handful of Liberal Democrat MPs and a Tory government. We have to have a Labour government. And I think that's been clear from what I've said so far, but with regards to this particular issue, the NHS needs to have a Labour government now. 
because if we don't have the Labour government, my fear is that we don't have a people's vote, we do have a Johnson-style trade deal, um, and, I, and I think this is real worry right now for the NHS, and I know you want to write to apologize, fair enough. Um, but I think that is the key issue in this election. It's the government we want. Do we want a Conservative? Do we want a Labour government? Even with the minority government, I fear that we're still treading towards Johnson's deal right now. Okay. Um, this is, I guess, more with you as a Conservative majority and you are Conservative MP. Yeah. Would you please say yes. um, <coughs> So the, the short answer is yes. The long answer, um, the, the Labour has, in every election for the last, I mean, certainly as, I, as far as I can remember, the last 30 years, the Labour have been uh, uh, saying the, uh, the NHS is for sale, the Tories will sell the NHS, privately the NHS, etc., uh, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And it, that may be good politics, uh, but it's emphatically untrue. And the, uh, and the NHS has been around for 71 years. The Conservatives have been in charge of it for 44 of those years. Uh, and uh, they, they haven't uh, sold it off. The, the, the US trade deal... Who um, sold 15.8 billion the pounds of it in the last five years? years? Who works in the NHS? I saw what Andrew Lantley's reforms have done and the damage which has been caused and bits of the NHS have undoubtedly been sold. Of has been in, had, and against ever since I was writing about the NHS to over 20 years ago has been in perpetual crisis it's always it always needs more money it always needs uh, reform it's never uh, never perfect um, the and in fact the Labour government I mean Tony Blair went, went down and uh, uh, introduced a lot of private provision in the NHS on the trade deal point which the question is specific about uh, the um, the, I, I don't know how clearer the government could make it I mean both uh, Matt Hancock and uh, 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 the Prime Minister made repeatedly clear that the NHS is not for sale and is out of scope in that trade deal. And you indeed saw uh, Donald Trump today saying he's not interested in uh, not interested in the NHS. I certainly would not um, approve of any deal. Uh, I certainly would not approve of any deal uh, which is detrimental to the interests of the NHS or uh, to the interests of NHS's patients. So just to clarify, because you said the short answer was yes. If the opposition in a Conservative majority government put an amendment to the bill that NHS pricing will be taken off the table and which, will, amendments, I I would, I would, which I I'm push. sure they will. Is the short answer still yes? I would vote for that amendment against your own government. I would, I would look, I, 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 I don't want to commit myself totally to things in the future that are entirely hypothetical, but I would absolutely push and commit myself to Trump doing everything I can to get, uh, to make sure that drug pricing is not part of any trade deal. And could that include supporting an, amendment, yeah. an opposition amendment? So the short yes. answer is yes. <laughs> okay, just to run through um, where we are for the rest of the evening, there's a group of questions coming up on Brexit now. There's then a question on gener the generational wealth divide. Um, and there were six questions, very specific questions, submitted by a gentleman who's not able to be here this evening. So in terms of timing, um, if it's okay, I suggest we take those six questions outside the meeting. And I just, if you are, if you kindly email me the answers, they're, they're very specific. Yeah, um, and they're all from the same person, so I think we could best handle it for him by doing it outside. Um, so the next group of questions are more specific on Brexit, and this um, they are um, two individual candidates. So um, unfortunately, there is no directly to Dan, but I mean. Please comment on them, Dan. Um, it's my style. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure you can. Um, the first one, um, which I have like to ask because the person isn't here again, um, is to Ian. As a clear Remain voice in this election, was Joe Swinson wise to commit to the immediate provocation of Article 50 without further consideration of the options in the people's vote? Um, the second question is to Anthony. What Brexit policy, however unexpected to you now, would cause you to rebel and vote against your own party if in government or other working arrangement? Um, specifically, if a trade deal is not negotiated by the year end 2020 and a hard Brexit is pursued by the government, would you rebel to extend the time limit? And the third question is, um, again to, to Anthony, in a remain constituency, how is it credible? I'm sorry for that. Good question to Labour. Well, the, um, well, if the audience come, comes up with a direct question to Labour to balance this, please, please do. I'll read this one out first. Um, in, a, 
in a strong Remain constituency, how is it credible that you can support the most disastrous of options and no deal Brexit, even as a last resort? It is not democratic. No one voted for no deal, so why not support a people's vote? Yes, please. Um, uh, would the Labour Party be prepared to repeal the Health and Social Care Act that was passed in 2012, which forms the basic premise on which uh, it can be in, health can be included in a trade deal because um, sectors of it have become privatised? In the TTIP negotiations, um, our public services were very vulnerable uh, because they've been privatised. Um, and once they're privatised, it's um, certainly they didn't succeed in removing it from the negotiations with the US. Once things are privatised, they're up to being a trade deal. So would Labour repeal the Health and Social Care Act? That's my question. So, we have a vote in 2016. I'm not sure everyone remembers it and the country voted to leave. But on the ballot paper, it wasn't laid out what that would look like. Many people would say they know what they were voting for, and I'm sure overall, in principle, they did. But the specifics were for the government of the time to go and negotiate, go and decide and interpret that result, that instruction from 2016. I don't think any government should proceed without some form of democratic scrutiny. And the Liberal Democrats have advocated for three and a half years since that referendum that democratic scrutiny would be most appropriate through a people's vote. It started with a referendum. Let's see what the government comes up with and check with the people who mandated this in the first place, that that is what they wanted. Parliament hasn't agreed. Parliament has retained that scrutiny for itself, and their scrutiny has said this deal isn't good enough, or these three deals aren't good enough. At each time, we would have been very happy to support any of those deals subject to a people's vote, because we think that remaining in the EU is the best option and people should be given that option again. <coughs> given that scrutinisation process has taken place, it's not consistent for us in this, this position now when there is a deal on the table to, to say, we believe remaining in the EU is the right thing to do, but we're going to, give, we're going to open it up. This is a democratic choice at this election. We are providing the choice to say, if you don't want it, elect a, a Liberal Democrat majority government. And it is only in the event of a Liberal Democrat majority. Now, I'm sure that these two guys will, will laugh at me. I'm sure that you guys will laugh at me if I was to suggest that Joe Swinson is going to become a Prime Minister at the end of next week. I'm not suggesting it's going to turn around, but this is about choice. That's the, that's the option that is consistent with our values and our beliefs. If, if we don't get a majority, which I'm not expecting, I can be honest about that, then we will continue to press for a people's vote as we have done for the last three and a half years. And hopefully, in this parliament to come, we will find more people ready to support what is the right thing, is to give that democratic scrutiny back to the people. Let's not forget that actually what the Liberal Democrats policy actually is, is just to annul the referendum and just cancel it. And why would anyone vote ever again in a referendum or election if they knew that the result of it could just be uh, cancelled? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is entirely undemocratic uh, just to cancel a referendum, which uh, was the biggest electoral uh, exercise 
uh, democratic exercise we've ever had in this country. Um, the, tr the trouble with the second referendum is uh, that the, the, there's multiple ones. So, so one is that uh, it will carry on the fighting. I mean, do people really want another referendum campaign now? Uh, the people when I speak to them on, on the door are so fed up with everything they just want everything uh, over. The trouble, the trouble with the second referendum is, is this: that actually it will have one or two results. So either uh, it will be uh, Brexit again, in which case you've changed nothing for the sake of another. Uh, you know, we'll have a long six months fighting, uh, or years fighting, or it will uh, be Remain. And one thing I can actually guarantee you is just as the Remain half of the population didn't accept the result of the first referendum, the Brexit half of the population wouldn't accept the result of the second referendum. Yeah. And then what do you have? The best of three? It just goes on and on. And actually we did it. We talk, talk to people on the doorstep. I, um, it is, to pick up on one of the other points, it is a it is a pro-Remain constituency. 60% of people here voted Remain in, in 2016. One of the things that has struck me on the doorstep is how people's attitudes have shifted. And I, I mean, a lot of people who uh, uh, voted Remain but just say, we think everyone's got really strong opinions on Brexit. Actually, a lot of people don't. Uh, they voted Remain and just say, well, it was a referendum, we lost, therefore it should just be done. Uh, there's another group of people who are more, uh, slightly stronger Remainers who say, well, actually, I don't like the... I uh, uh, didn't like the referendum, don't want Brexit, but I'm so fed up after three and a half years of fighting that we should just get it over and done with. And then there's a third group, uh, uh, which is where the Lib Dems are, which are just wanting to uh, uh, cancel Brexit. And it's not obvious to me where the balance of opinion is in this constituency. And the, picking up on the, the third question here, uh, that actually I would be, and I, I get challenged on this point every time I do regular interviews, um, what I'm not going to do is get elected on a manifesto commitment uh, and then immediately renege on it, which is what the uh, which happened to the last MP, and it goes down really, really badly. People expect MPs to uh, do what they're paid to do, uh, and not to immediately rip up manifesto commitments as soon as they're made. And I would be elected on a manifesto commitment to uh, get Brexit done or over and done with in the best possible way, and that's what I would uh, uh, support. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Look, democracy doesn't stop at 2016. We don't have to keep electing governments until we get an, a, a, a parliament that matches the result of 2016. We are allowed to change our minds in a democracy. That is democracy. And if the next referendum is lost, then absolutely, if the Leave voters wish to go out and campaign for another referendum, they are within their rights to do so. That is democracy, Anthony. It might annoy people. Yeah, democracy is hard. It's hard. You've got to trade these things off. And 2016 has, has opened up a division in this country. And it's going to be hard to heal that division, whatever go, whatever happens from here. But I would rather be trying to heal that division with a strong economy, rather than deliberately damaging the social cohesion of this country further, and trying to fix the divisions in that. That's going to be a hell of a more difficult problem. So democracy, democracy did not end in 2016. There has been scrutiny of what the government has done, and it's been found wanting by all sides. Yeah. Yeah, anyone want to comment on that, and then also the specific question about the repeal of the um, Care Act of 2012? Okay, so that's the longest I've been quiet apart from sleep for a long time, and it's really uncomfortable. Um, but right, so um, I just want to pick up on, on those points, really. But I guess it's also some questions because I think this is important to define our positions here. Uh, and, the, and the question is, and you don't have to answer this, chaps, you don't want to. But firstly, Anthony, do you honestly believe that this area would be better off with a Johnson trade deal? Uh, secondly, Anthony, how? Uh, Ian, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Ian, uh, different style. Um, how do you get to a people's vote in Parliament, uh, you know, from the Liberal Democrat position? Now, you can answer those or not, that's up to you. But what I would say is that I honestly think that yes, Remain is the best option. And my worry would be, uh, what sort of people's vote do you have as well? If you have a people's vote with Johnson's deal on one side and Remain, 
I fear we still sleepwalk into that deal. And that's why I was a bit worried about the people's way before, because there was a lot of talk about a year ago, if you remember, about having no deal as an option on ballot paper. And that's really scary, because that's how we then sleepwalk into a more dangerous situation. Now, in 2016, Nigel Farage himself was happy to have a Norwegian-style trade arrangement between Britain and the, and the rest of the EU. Um, and now it seems like the, you have this kind of pure version of Brexit, which means somehow complete isolation from the rest of Europe, and then we're going to be this massive like, free trading nation of the world. And I just fear for the NHS and, and all our regulations. Um, or you have complete Remain, and I still think in that situation Remain is better than any deal we can come up with, even a Labour deal. <coughs> a Labour deal would be a far less damaging deal, but even in that situation it's Remain. So the question is, how do you get there? The only party that can form a government is the Labour Party, and the only party to offer the people's vote is the Labour Party, and the vast majority of the Labour Party, including myself, will campaign for Remain, because we know we know full well that's the best deal we have. I wouldn't want to be on a protest march after the point of no return just protesting about this. I want to have a pragmatic solution, and I honestly think democracy is the answer to that, and I know what you're writing down. <laughs> now, yeah. the next point. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the next point. I was talking to a lever in Campbell, and he was raging with the idea of revoking Article 50. But I honestly think, after conversation, if we can make the positive case, and so much of politics has become the negative, the whole Remain campaign in many ways was a negative campaign, if we can make the positive case for Europe, and then let people in the privacy of the ballot uh, decide what they want to, I honestly think that is a way to de-escalate de de the tensions we have right now. Because certainly in 2016, nobody voted to make themselves poorer, nobody voted uh, well, firstly, they were misled in many ways in that referendum, but nobody was voting to make their lives worse than they would be in the future. And so for that reason, I think that is a very good way to try to de-escalate the situation. It's not revoke, it's not carrying Bob Johnson's deal. I am, bizarrely, the moderate on this issue because I believe in democracy. The next point about TTIP and about the um, Health and Social Care Act. So it actually relates to what Anthony was talking about earlier on. Uh, that there are, uh, there are up to now £10 billion pounds worth of privatisation in the NHS that has increased massively after the last Labour government. But I appreciate people say things in the past, they may have changed their mind. Equally, I'm happy to look at government policy decisions which were wrong, and PFI has been wrong for our NHS. So, in that case, we have to reverse the Health and Social Care Act, is what your question was. Uh, to the GP in the room, I'm sure you're more than aware than most of us the stress and the strain that you are under, and in many ways the CCG is part of that problem with £75 million pounds in the red. And is that because they're incompetent the way they run things, or because it's starved from central government? Maybe a mixture of the two. So I suggest we fund the NHS properly, we make sure we actually plan and organise and arrange the NHS in a much more sensible way with strategy and planning, and ultimately we're in a situation where we can put money to curing people, not to paying the legal fees when we get sued by Virgin, because they're suing us for not giving them the contract. So let's be radical and put the money into where the people need it, that's into ill health to make them better again. Can I check if the questioner wants to come back on that and then give the right reply to Ian and Anthony? Are you happy with that? Yes. Yeah, great. Okay, so if Ian and Anthony wish to respond to um, any doubts, comments, I think Ian was writing down for yourself. And if you want to, if you don't want to, I'll leave that. Well, uh, how many people can you guess what I wrote down when, when uh, Dan was talking? Anybody? So, I wrote down, not Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn has been weak on Brexit through the entire process. No, he hasn't. No, he we, hasn't. We, we have to disagree on that. It, 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 Simply inconsistent. Consistent in wanting to leave the EU, yeah. and that's that's pretty much consistent with his entire career. Yeah. <laughs> it's all, all the, <laughs> the the if you if you want to stop Brexit, vote for a party and a, that has been committed. To stopping Brexit through the entire process. How are you going to do that? How are you actually going to stop Brexit? 
I would, I would, I would invite you to see how we have stopped Brexit so far. We, 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 we were supposed to leave earlier this, uh, this year. The idea of a people's vote was a fringe idea when the Liberal Democrats first suggested it. They have campaigned hard and brought others along to that position. So in, individuals, small, small individuals can be, become bigger organisations, they can work with other parties. We've done it before, we can do it again. In South Cambridgeshire, stopping Brexit is about stopping the Conservatives getting a majority. This is a safe, this has been a safe Conservative seat. It isn't this time. It, it is a Conservative, Liberal, Democrat marginal. So if you want to stop Boris Johnson's Brexit, you need to stop him getting a majority and you need to elect a Liberal Democrat in South Cambridgeshire. But even as part of the coalition, you're not going to be able to just stop Brexit. So, there are, the, the, the mechanism to stop Brexit is ultimately revoking Article 50. We're not going to have a majority for that, either, unless there's a big change in Parliament. Possibly if we hit a cliff edge, we might, then, that, that might change people's minds in Parliament. But yes, it looks likely that it would be towards a, a people's vote. We've been campaigning that for three, for three and a half years. We're not leaving that policy behind. So a people's vote with Remain on the ballot paper is, is still very much part of Liberal Democrat policy. And it has been throughout the last three and a half the years. The manifesto is to revoke Article 50, the, the policy, the policy, the, no, the policy, no, the policy passed at conference, because Liberal Democrat policy is made by its, its members at conference. And the policy passed at conference is very clear in the event of a Liberal Democrat, and the manifesto is the same, in the event of a Liberal Democrat majority, we would revoke Article 50, because we would take a majority uh, in, in, in a, a general election as a mandate to do that. Now, clearly, if we don't win a majority, then we don't have a mandate to do that. We won't get that through Parliament. That's the way that representative democracy works. But we still have that policy, as we have done for the last three and a half years, when we haven't had a majority in Parliament either, of a people's vote. And we've campaigned successfully to bring other parliamentarians on board with that policy. So you can make a big difference as a small party. Just to come up, because of course that relates to my party, um, I don't think that's completely sincere when you just said that you're not happy with the voting system we have, and yet with a minority mandate, you think that somehow justifies over, uh, over you know, overriding uh, a very large majority in that referendum. And I think that's why democracy in a referendum is the answer, not democracy through parliamentary votes in first, first past the post. Yeah, yeah. And I, thank you, Mark. And that's my first year here this time. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I'm also good. However, however, I suspect, and you can correct me here if I'm wrong, that the Liberal Democrats were making that pledge as a very loud sound to all the remainders in the country to gain their vote by saying we are going to revoke and vote for us, knowing full well that you would not have a majority, so you wouldn't actually have to follow through with it, but it would be like the anti-dog whistle for those remainers. And my fear is, if you make promises in a general election that you don't really feasibly think you're going to fulfill because you don't have to, then that's not being sincere or genuine with the electorate, and it's quite dangerous. And we know of Liberal Democrat policies in the past which were pledged, which then had to be U-turned on in government. So I think you have to be really clear of what you're promising, that you mean it, you intend to deliver on it. If not, and I think the revoke was wrong, because like I say, first past the post would mean you'd maybe have 40% of the popular vote if you had one as the government, and yet you'd be delivering something which goes against a clear over 50% decision in the referendum. So on the, uh, on the, the switch in, in uh, whether you have a mandate, 
the Liberal Democrats won 12 MPs in the 2017 election. It is conceivable that, yes, we could get a majority in, with 40% of the, the popular vote. Um, I think, actually, if you look at it, the swing that we would require on a national basis in order to gain a majority would be significantly more. I mean, it's possible, but it would be significantly more. So it would actually put that our threshold a lot, a lot higher. But the revoke policy isn't really, it is about what it says to our values. We are being consistent with our values. We think re remain is the best option. We have a clearly negotiated deal now. We think remain is the better option. And we're just saying so. We are just saying that if we had the opportunity, we would stop this because it is the best thing to do. So we're speaking honestly to our values on that. Then. So, so what does that say to the, the, the majority of the people who voted in the referendum? What does that say to them about the value of democracy? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, so I, I find one of the things about the second referendum that uh, worries me, and this is just from a, a social point of view, is that we have become very divided as a country, and we're united to be fed up with Brexit, we're divided over the issue itself. And we started the first referendum a lot more united as a country. You had one referendum, we get divided. It divides families, it divides communities. Uh, and the, uh, if we start have a second referendum, we're going to start from a position of being far more uh, divided already. And the people, just talking to people, and I'm sure you, you referred to this conversation uh, earlier, you had with the Brexiteer and Campbell, there, there is a lot of anger out there in the streets. Not, not this is a moderate uh, constituency compared to lots of other parts of the country. There are a lot of people like, get really, really angry. Why do we need a second referendum? We had a referendum and it just hasn't been delivered. And I, I really fear about what it's going to do to um, this country. So it's going to get more and more deeply and deeply and passionately divided if we have a second <coughs> referendum. Isn't the get Brexit done mantra dishonest too, though? Because a lot of people that I've talked to on the doorstep in my modest way, um, who aren't very involved in politics, they do seem to believe that it can be done by the end of January. And that is a lie, basically. That's a big, fat lie. Mm -hmm. And people are going to be still angry, even with Boris, if he becomes Prime Minister and doesn't get Brexit done by the end of January. So how are you going to deal with that? So the, the Brexit done, uh, if there is a Conservative majority and we therefore follow through with our manifesto commitment to pass the, uh, the, the new withdrawal agreement, uh, then we will leave the EU on January 31st. Yeah, that's and, not what most people understand. Like, that, that's, that's, so we'll be, we'll be outside the EU. I, I, mean, I have this conversation with a lot of different people. Like, the, the Brexit is a peculiarly passionate, emotional uh, issue for, you know, for an awful lot of people. Uh, and that's partly because it's about identity. A whole load of other issues are wrapped up in there, whether you're outward looking and internationalists or people who like to see themselves as their sort of inward looking and British, etc. The, whole, the people get very, very uh, wound up about it. And, but actually once, uh, and, and that's why we've had two general elections, we've had two MPs uh, lose their jobs, David Cameron and Theresa May, we've had new political parties starting up, Change UK, the Brexit party, you know, it's, we've had all these mass defections of MPs. I mean, it is the most extraordinarily passionate, toxic issue, the very issue of whether we're in the EU or out of the EU. Once we're out of the EU, you're right, it's not done in the sense of we clearly then have to negotiate the future uh, trade agreement, uh, and that is not a simple thing at all. I'm well aware, I've been involved, I know all negotiations uh, for the banking industry with the European Parliament and the Commission and the, uh, and the European Council about all these trade negotiations with these financial services, so I'm, I'm well aware of the uh, complexities of it all. Uh, but the essential issue of being in or out of the EU would have been resolved on that point. And I cannot see, oh, there'll be lots of debate about the future trade agreements, and I'm sure we can have lots of debates about it. And frankly, as I said earlier, I think it's actually good that MPs or one of the MPs the and the Scots, States. Can you let, Scots let, let me the, and the can Irish I, can I just let, me, let me make my point. You, 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 the, the, you essential, the, the essential, the essential uh, point is that, um, of the new trade agreement that actually the, it won't be such a toxic issue because it isn't about identity in such a way. You won't get uh, people setting up new political parties on this trade agreement versus that trade agreement. You won't get people resigning from their parties and setting up new political parties uh, uh, for it on that. You won't get marches with a million people because they want this trade agreement rather than that trade agreement. I think it, so 
Yes, uh, Brexit will be done in the sense we've left the EU. Yes, you're right, there will clearly be future negotiations, and yes, those will be complex, but actually the whole uh, passionate existential issue of Brexit will be largely taken off the table, and I think we will get uh, politics, that will, I mean, it won't return completely to normal, but it will be a lot more normal than compared to what we've had over the last three and a half years. Do you really think that you're, you're talking as if people becoming angry is a bad thing? People going on marches and expressing their opinions, that isn't a bad thing. It bad leads thing. to a, well, I think, feel that that's what you're saying. It, it perhaps mean? is leading to change, and it is a very uncomfortable situation. It is really uncomfortable for everybody at the moment. But anger should not necessarily say, we want you all to be nice and quiet now and not angry anymore. No, I think the anger is good. And if I may say, I think some of us here really possibly resent your comments about our current MP. In, you know, don't deride her for having thought, uh, experienced Parliament, experienced the Conservative Party, finding that it's something she can't live with, and she made changes. And that is not something that I think most people here would deride. Mm -hmm. We might actually say, well done. Anything bad with marches? I don't. I think it's great. You know, people participate in any sort of democratic uh, action. I think that's great, and I encourage everyone to get involved. What I don't think is good is where there is. We have a situation where there are large parts of the population with large amounts of anger in them, and anger against other people, and anger, uh, you know, against government, and anger everything. It's not, that's clearly not a healthy society with so much uh, ang anger in it. And I want to uh, get to a situation. Maybe if we didn't have to all this that provoked anger. Um, <laughs> Where we reunite the country and uh, that we all feel a united country again. Now, that's not, I mean, I think we can all agree that's not going to be easy and straightforward, and we'll disagree on the route for that, but that's to where, I, where I want to go to. And, and the point, we, I, I, we, we, and on we, the previous MP, I don't, I don't, didn't mean to disrespect her, all I was saying, they're, they're really, and one thing that struck me on the doorstep is there is a lot of anger uh, from voters about. MPs who break their own manifesto commitments and change parties. I mean, it's a very yeah, profoundly yeah, yeah. held belief by a lot of people, and of the thousands of people I spoke to, the overwhelming majority think MPs should do what they're paid to do and elected to do. And, and and that's, we, we have to stop full time on Brexit now because we're, yeah. we're almost out of time. But I mean, I'm sure there'll be you can follow up. Sorry, Dan. I just want to add that, that actually. This is an internal Tory war that has spilled into all our lives now. <laughs> From Maastricht all the way through to now, it's the Tories fighting for themselves. And the other point I want to raise is this. There is a reason that Brexit hasn't happened yet, and I'm sorry Ian, it's not you. It's Boris Johnson and the ERG. They stopped Brexit because they have a purer ideological view of what Brexit is. And I don't trust it. And, yes, okay. You expect the Labour... Oh, so you expect the opposition parties to vote for what the government wants. That's not how parliamentary democracy works. Whereas your own government... Just to point out parliamentary democracy, though, Anthony. So what we have, then, is this civil war that's continuing now. And we know that now the people who are against the slightly better version of Brexit, who now want this more extreme version of Brexit, are going for the driving, the steering wheel. So we now have a choice through democracy again to make the choice as to who is in charge of the country. And it seems quite clear to me that most people I suggest in this room want a people's vote. In that case, you know which way to vote. Because Ed Davey said himself that he is worried or he thinks that he can convince Boris Johnson to have a people's vote with a minority Conservative government. That won't happen. Yes. What would the candidates like to see done to address the gaping generational wealth divide? As an example of the current unfairness, compare the younger generation's student debt, insecure employment, excessive hours of work, unaffordable housing, and lack of support for their young families with the older generation's 
triple lock pension, accumulated assets, winter fuel allowances, free prescriptions, and bus travel. <laughs> Can I also add that the average income of, of the retired exceeds the, that of those who work and have young families? Is that sustainable? Is it fair? Yes, it is a generational um, discrimination, actually. Yeah. And what I find very interesting working as a teacher is that there is this kind of growing frustration and anger now. And if I just look back to the last Labour government, EMA, for instance, was a really good example of how funding was given to students to help them stay in school. And when I worked in a very deprived area of the country, kids in sick form were working in shops and things to try and make money to help pay <coughs> the bills of their families. They really were struggling. So we had policies to try and help them. And clearly, a huge part of the debt slavery we see nowadays is students going to university, they're taking on up to £50,000 worth of debt. When you're a debt slave, you don't have freedom, you don't have autonomy. And that's why we say we'd have free university education for everyone in this country. Plus, education shouldn't stop at a certain age. You should have opportunity to retrain if you wish to, to have that throughout the whole of your lives. There are far too many people who get written off at age 16. And then that's it for the rest of their lives. They don't have the GCSEs. So let's put education in. That would be a huge area of social uh, justice that we could do quite quickly. In regards to your other points, you said about things like triple lock um, and the, um, the, the great deal that older people have. I don't think it has to be either or. I think it can be both. I think you can have a, a rebalancing without taking away from the older generations, who at the same time the triple lock, I mean, the last election I know that the Tories dropped that because they took their voters for granted and look what happened. Uh, we kept the triple lock then. We still say that the pensioners, regardless of who they vote for, should have a triple lock on their pension. It shouldn't be taken out by a green treasury. But at the same time, young people don't have access to the housing. I know from somebody who rents, who pays out nursery fees, which are incredibly expensive, that my wife and I, we're only a teacher and a doctor and I've got a business, we have no way we're going to make enough money to live here in our own home. We really struggle and it's really hard. So building houses, making them more accessible to young people would be a huge social justice issue again that we could really help so many families. And the other thing I'd say as well is, if you think about democracy, I honestly believe that 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds should have the vote. Mm. And I think that school programmes, I teach government politics and history, and I honestly believe when you have a debate in a classroom, even younger than 16, I think 16 is that sort of age where you're sitting in GCSEs, you're making choices in your options that will, in your exams, sorry, that will then affect the rest of your life. So why not have a say in democracy as well? And if we had a program in schools to help inform young people about the issues in a very non-partisan, neutral way, I think that generation can be really mobilised to do a lot of good. And look what happened in Scotland in the referendum in 2014. That was one of the biggest voting blocks there was because they realise it's their future. Give democracy to people, and lo and behold, the government will listen to them. So that's what we must do. Is that Labour Party policy, though? Uh, oh, I think yes. <laughs> it's it's in the manifesto. I'll check. Hang on. <laughs> That's a really good point, actually. I've got a manifesto here. I'll check that now. But uh, I, I will double check that. But if it's not, it definitely should be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's happened a few times at these hustings. This is our fifth hustings. Which there. one? Sorry, what, what's come up? <laughs> uh, the things that Dan would like to see in the Labour Party manifesto that aren't. So, uh, <laughs> Uh, we had uh, proportional representation, I believe, was one of the things that you had to get for, which the Labour Party is the only socialist slash social democratic party in Europe that doesn't support some kind of proportional representation. Well, just to create the record, because I think you should withdraw that comment, I didn't say that uh, that wasn't a manifesto. I said that I personally think we should move towards AMS system, and I'm happy to campaign for that within the Labour Party. Uh, not the same as saying it, something that I said was in the manifesto. I did, I did, I did just, make just, that just, 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 just to said, clarify. I said I hope that you would be right in the next Labour manifesto. Just, 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 just to clarify though, that, 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 I hope the implication is now misleading people. No, 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 no. Maybe Ian could actually address the question. Okay. Yeah. Just to, uh, it, just to point out that Votes for 16 has been a long time Liberal uh, Democrat policy. Um, and I think it would make a difference for all the, the points that Dan raises. I would just like to see more political parties as a whole, rather than just individuals, adopt that as a policy. 
Um, look, on the, on the generational uh, wealth divide, this is an issue that we haven't been talking enough about. There's a, there's a huge demographic problem in the country. We've got a lot of retired people and they're living longer and they, they cost more and there is nothing wrong, there's no, nothing wrong with that, but it's not the way our economy was set up when we set up pensions and the welfare state. Actually, pensioners fell behind by a long way and Credit to the Labour government, they did a lot to help uh, pensioner poverty uh, be solved. But the, the, the dial has shifted, and the dial has shifted because at the same time, we've stored up a major housing crisis for, for ourselves. And the housing crisis is, is the major driver of the, of the wealth inequality in the country. So, we're not, going to, we're not going to solve that overnight. Um, but we do need, we all know that we need to get building a lot more houses across the country to address that housing crisis. And we need more uh, social housing and, uh, as well as more, uh, just more, more general housing and better, better, better protections for for renters, a, a, a healthier private rental market, that will drive a lot of the solutions to the to to these these issues. But they are long term. They are long term solutions. Some of the things that come in terms of policies that come down to some of the other issues that you mentioned, the job insecurity. The, one of the Liberal Democrats' manifesto commitments is to propose a new dependent contractor status for people working in the gig economy and uh, I think a 20% uplift on the, on the uh, minimum wage for those in that dependent contractor state status to start to give them more, more, more protection as, as well in terms of legal protection of, and the right to request a fixed term contract for example. So that, there's lots of nitty gritty legislation that we need to look at to protect young people who are in, in the gig economy. Lots of people like the flexibility of the gig economy. And I think one of the areas of progress that we can make across people in work is actually more people having flexibility within their, within their working life. Um, but there's, there's, there's got to be that protection that goes along with it. Um, great question, and as somebody who's got children, as I mentioned earlier, um, incredibly important. I think it's uh, really important that young people grow up uh, and believe that they can realise their ambitions and their dreams. I believe in aspiration, I believe in hard work, I believe in it being rewarded. And then we have a younger generation that are despairing and think that it's not fair. Uh, and there is this huge uh, generational wealth divide, uh, then that, that isn't good for them, it isn't good for the country uh, as a whole. David Willits uh, wrote a book ahead of the 2010 election uh, on the generational wealth divide, which I helped him with uh, a little bit. And uh, it, is, it is a real issue, and there are many reasons behind it, uh, some of which are being touched on. I mean, one of the greatest ones is housing. You know, we have obviously uh, built too little housing in this country, given the, uh, the, the growing demand for it. And actually, you look at the age of uh, one of the almost something like ninety percent of people want to own their own home. It's a big dream, own the roof over their heads, and actually you're finding the age of first-time home ownership is rising, 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 rising. And increasingly, young people are moving back home after they've left home, uh, after they've gone off to university. They're coming back home with boomerang kids, and that's essentially incredibly demoralising for them. They can't uh, uh, lead, lead their own lives. We need to build more housing so that people can get on the housing ladder and realise their dreams. And actually, house building rates have gone up. We've now got house building at the uh, highest rate for 20 years or so, I think it still needs to go up uh, go up a bit more. Some of the uh, things I think like um, we are bringing in, the, uh, we're all committed to bringing in a higher minimum wage, we've said £10.50 an hour, uh, that will disproportionately benefit uh, young people. Um, I think on the issue of student loans, uh, 
it is very high. I think the uh, the interest rates on student loans being 6% at the moment, I think is not yeah. uh, justifiable. And I fully support uh, reviewing that. I can't see, that's a, essentially you're asking students to make up for the uh, bad credit risk of other students who are not going to pay off their loans. It doesn't seem fair to me that you're uh, asking them to do that. It should be wider society that does that. Um, the uh, when I was younger, uh, I remember the recessions, uh, that we had a really bad recession in the uh, early 1990s, shortly after I left uh, university, and it was the uh, unemployment rate, and youth unemployment rate was incredibly high, and that was incredibly uh, demoralising, and I got made redundant twice, I uh, spent a short time being unemployed, and that is what eats people's souls and eats people's uh, dreams, and I don't think anyone uh, you know, should have to go through that. What I would say now is, is good about the labour market is we actually have very high, we've got a record level of employment in the UK now, more people working than ever before. We've got a record low level of uh, unemployment, at least the lowest for about 30 years. And I certainly want to make sure that we have a strong and robust economy to make sure that young people, when they are leaving university, there are jobs for them to go to, which is what we have at the moment. One of the fears I have about uh, Jeremy Corbyn is, we haven't really talked about this, but uh, I think if, if he came in, he would wreck the economy very rapidly, and you would find uh, unemployment rising uh, very, very rapidly. And the other, the final point I'll make about intergenerational fairness that is, um, is the one about government debt and deficit. And my, my children were asking me about what, what, the, what all this austerity was back in the uh, election in um, 2015. And uh, the, I think all generations <coughs> have basically a moral duty to uh, live within their means. And I said to my children, it's like me building up my credit card debts and then, uh, because I'm, I'm, I want a fancy lifestyle but I'm not paying for it myself, and then passing on the credit card debts to my children. But essentially what we're doing as a country, if governments aren't living within their means, what they do, and our generation isn't living within their means, we're building up debts and we're getting our children to pay off the uh, interest on it and the, uh, the debt on it. And that is incredibly unfair on future generations simply to pass on their debts. As individuals, we can't pass on our debts to our children. But as a country, we can pass on our debts to our children. And that's why I think we actually have a moral obligation to try and live within our means as a, as a generation. But it is a really important issue, and I, it touches on so many different uh, things that you, you, you point out, but it certainly is something that I would prioritize. Say that all three of your party's manifestos are very generous to the elderly um, and um, promise to increase the um, um, generational wealth gap. Um, and also that the Conservatives um, seem intent on increasing the escalating wealth of the rich and the super rich. Um, there's enough wealth in this country to meet the basic needs of everyone. It's the distribution of that wealth that is currently wrong. So, um, yeah, this is an economic question as well, isn't it? And um, I just get a bit frustrated by some smoke and mirrors there. So, yes, record uh, levels of employment in the country. At the same time, productivity is very low. Now, there's an interesting correlation there. When zero-hour contracts mean that you can have one hour of employment a week and be counted as employed, and that you can tell with the ONS. So, that is just disingenuous. And that's showing that for the headlines of the Daily Mail tomorrow, you can say unemployment is at its lowest level ever. However, you yourself have experienced unemployment under a conservative recession, uh, the majority of which have been under conservative recessions, uh, of governments, because of the speculation and the free market. <laughs> and if you look at, for instance, 2008, that was again following very much Thatcherite policies by the government, the Labour Party at the time, and I think that was one of the biggest problems we faced, where the world was at the casino, speculation, and who pays for that is the youngest generation. Now, the Labour manifesto is one that's trying to readdress the imbalance, because the economy is not in a good position, like you said. And the analogy used about the credit card is wrong, because in actual fact, private debt, our credit cards have taken on that debt. Public debt has been going down, but, well, not again, that's 83% now, it's the highest it's been for a long, long time. But at the same time, private debt has also steadily risen as well, which means the most vulnerable people are most at threat for the next crisis whenever that happens. And it will, because that's what capitalism does. So young people have been ripped off by this government. They've been ripped off by the coalition. We know that as well. And we are saying we want to really make a difference to give that generation opportunity. In particular, sure start centres. 
Why were they closed? If you honestly want to save money, why did the Tory councillors give themselves an increase in their allowance and cut the money towards short sort centres? That's disgusting. But we're saying... <laughs> I think that you, know, the, you, you rightly point out that this is this is an issue that we should be talking about. At the risk of bringing it back to Brexit, Brexit has taken up the oxygen from discussing these kinds of issues. Parliament has has ground to a ground to a standstill while the Conservatives have tried to work out what Brexit means other than Brexit. There are there are, there are long term shifts at play in, in in the country. And these are the ones that we should be debating and having a having a public debate about. It. I think this election starts to touch on it, but we have to resolve Brexit first because Brexit really is an inju another injustice against young people. I would advocate that 16-year-olds should have the, have the vote. If you go back that, that far, there's a, a huge number of, of electors now that did not have a say in, in 2016. And their, their, their rights, at the same time as the, their, their, their opportunities are being uh, constrained, their rights and their opportunities in Europe are being constrained by Brexit. They deserve a chance to have the same opportunities that the older generation <coughs> Brexit is also very unfair to Scotland, and it's leading to an instability in Northern Ireland, and it's unfair to Wales, it's unfair to Cambridgeshire, it's unfair to London. It, it's an extremely divisive thing. It's unfair yeah. to the poorest who think getting Brexit done will make them better off. It yes. 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 Yeah. And so do you want a last response for? No, I'll just say on the choice of the next government, as I said, is basically between a Conservative majority or a hung parliament, and a hung parliament will just continue the, uh, the, the paralysis and the uh, indecision, and which is bad for businesses wanting to invest. Uh, and it, the uh, taking the auction out of everything else that uh, Ian uh, mentioned, it, that will just that will just carry on. Okay, uh, we're going to wrap it up there. I mean, I think some, some of us feel that the Prime Parliament has been the most democratic we've been in a long time. I mean, MPs have actually <laughs> spoken for themselves, but so, there's always views. I'd like everybody to say thank you very much to our three candidates tonight. They've been <laughs>